So, uh, thank you for the introduction and uh, thank you uh, to you, Manuel, and the rest of the Monetative organization for uh, setting this up. I'm uh, very, very impressed by that. And I'm especially impressed by your German uh, timekeeping. I think if the, financial, if the financial system was governed by the same level of discipline, we wouldn't have had a crisis in uh, 2007. So, um, so what I'll be talking about is uh, central bank digital currency and Folgild and, and the differences between uh, two uh, models of implementation. So as Manuel said, uh, my, I'm uh, an associate professor in philo philosophy and economics at the Copenhagen Business School. And um, indeed, my approach to this problem is uh, philosophical. And one of the methods of philosophy is the allegory. So, and probably the most famous allegory uh, in philosophy is Plato's allegory of the cave. And the purpose of an allegory is to simplify and identify the essence of a problem. And in that sense, philosophical allegories, they function much in the same way as the economic models that we've uh, seen from uh, Michael and uh, Steve, wherever he is. Uh, he's up there, yeah. Um, and I believe the essence of the problem of central bank, implementing central bank digital currency is the concept of parity. So that's why I've added this uh, subtitle to, uh, to my talk. Um, so I will start uh, by demonstrating this by way of an allegory. And just before we heard um, William White uh, say how 20th century economics got the economy wrong by assuming that it worked as a machine. And I very much agree with that, um, that critique. And what I will propose instead uh, is to view the economy more as a marriage. So I want to uh, invite you to imagine uh, a scenario. So imagine a man who's been married to the same woman for more than 20 years. You can even imagine that he's your friend. We can call him Jens, and we could call her uh, Tiffany. Now, uh, your friend Jens, he tells you that he's met a very sweet woman at work, and he's fallen in love with her. Uh, we could call her Birgit, and the love is mutual, so she's also fallen in love with Jens. And now Jens is thinking about what to do. And since he's your best friend, you've known him for a long time, and you also know his uh, wife, Tiffany, and you also know uh, things about their relationship. So you know that Tiffany, she's uh, quite demanding and quite possessive, and uh, she tends to blame him whenever she's unhappy. I think she's what you could call, uh, with a technical term, high maintenance. Uh, so this is not a very happy uh, relationship. And even 10 years ago, they even had a, a major crisis because Jens discovered that she'd had an affair with a real estate agent. <laughs> but Jens, uh, he is your good friend. And one of the reasons why he's uh, your good friend is because he's both a very conscientious and also a very loyal man. So he's made big compromises and hard, worked hard to keep uh, his marriage and his family together. However, still the marriage uh, isn't really working, mm, and it hasn't been working for several years. So he asks you for advice, and you're sort of considering his options. So on the one end of the spectrum, there's the possibility of just forgetting about Birgit and go on with his life with uh, uh, Tiffany. In the middle, there's, there's like the middle option would be have an affair with uh, Birgit, keep her as uh, his uh, mistress, however, without affecting or jeopardizing his marriage and his family life. And then, of course, at the very other end of the spectrum, there is the possibility of taking this as an opportunity to divorce his wife and uh, hope for a new relationship with this new woman. So what this allegory first provides us with is uh, a gist of the, the, the scenarios we're facing with the implementation of central bank digital currencies. So at the one end, we can just leave this alone. It's a silly option. It's, uh, yeah, uh, it's not worth thinking about. We could call that the Danish solution. Uh, so that would, this would be the equivalent to forgetting Birgit and staying with uh, Tiffany. Then the moderate or the middle position is to think of central bank digital currency as just a digital version of cash. So we will implement it as just an additional feature to the payment system. It will have no implications or no significant implications for monetary policy, no implications for financial stability, and also no implications for commercial banks. Uh, 
So we will have like a system where we have central bank digital currency in parallel with banking. We could call this the Swedish solution, and of course it would be equivalent to having Birgit as a mistress, sort of in parallel with, uh, with Tiffany. And then at the other, very other end, we, have, uh, we imp in implement CBDC as a complete substitute for bank money. So we reform the whole system, and this of course is the full guilt scenario, which uh, is the equivalent to uh, divorce and a new, new wife. So at the heart of this allegory, we have the concept of marriage, obviously. And at the heart of the problem of central bank digital currency and its relation to bank money is the concept of parity. So the relevance of the allegory hinges on a parallel logic between marriage and uh, parity. So let's start with marriage here. So I've uh, made this model. It's not quite the one that the BIS is uh, using. <laughs> so, uh, but as you can see here, marriage involves different multiple dimensions. So there's a legal aspect, which uh, when you're married, you have certain rights and obligations. There's also some moral obligations, which are, it's not only monogamy, but that's perhaps the most important one. And then finally, there's just a simple act of living together, having actual feelings for each other, and so forth. Um, and in a marriage, um, these dimensions are obviously, they're connected. So on the one hand, they are points that hold together the marriage, but at the other side, there are also points where the marriage can uh, break down. So let's turn now to parody, uh, pa um, parity. Um, so what I've done here is I've, uh, I'll, I'll fill in uh, to explain this model, but I've developed this model from uh, the three, based on the three functions of money. And I'll, first I'll consider it in like the modest version, like the di digital cash uh, version. So one dimension of this model is what I call exchange rate parity. And this is the fact that bank money is convertible into central bank digital currency at a one-to-one -one rate. And this exchange rate parity will be uh, sustained by commercial banks. I'm, I'm now assuming the model that uh, Joseph was uh, proposing and not uh, the one that uh, Michael was proposing. And in a, in a crisis, this will of course be, be backed by the central bank as a, a lender or a dealer of last resort. Then the second dimension is what I call settlement parity. And what this means is that uh, debts and taxes are settled at the nominal price regardless of whether you pay in uh, central bank money or whether you pay in bank money. And this is of course uh, sustained by the creditors that own the debt, this would be probably the banks, but also the treasury as uh, Joseph also touched upon. And then finally, uh, the last dimension of uh, parity is this purchasing power parity, uh, parity, which means that when we go out and buy assets, goods and services in the market, we pay the same price regardless of whether we pay with one form of mo money or the other. This dimension is largely, or if not exclusively, governed by the market forces. So the state has little or no direct control over this uh, space. So essentially the digital cash scenario is one where the central bank and the treasury take responsibility for exchange rate parity and settlement parity. And then they hope that the market will follow in sustaining uh, purchasing uh, power parity. So, but this, uh, the, this digital cash scenario uh, poses some uh, challenges. This, how, how do we make it work with a, with, in a system where there's both bank money and central bank digital currency both circulating? And I want to conceptualize these challenges using this concept of parity. And the challenges, they begin in the market because that's, that's the one, that's the, the sphere that's least governed by the state. Um, so the challenge here is now when we introduce central bank digital currency, we're introducing an alternative to bank money, an alternative means of exchange. And since it's also digital, it has the same utility as bank money. But in addition to having the same utility as a means of exchange, it's also risk-free, so which means that it's a superior uh, uh, store of value. And what this means also is now the market has a new benchmark for uh, valuations. And it also means that now a euro, if we're assuming the euro, uh, a euro may no longer just be a euro. It will depend on what kind of money uh, the euro is paid in. 
if we go a little bit back to our allegory, we see also how uh, the problem here was um, or started with the introduction of a new woman and which would then set into motion an, uh, a, a, an emotional re-evaluation of Jens's wife and his, uh, his uh, marriage. And, and the danger or the risk here is that the market begins to factor in the, uh, the risk of bank money relative to central bank digital currency into prices. So they may, the market may start quoting sort of split prices for assets and goods and services. Uh, and once that happened, purchasing power breaks down. And what then happens is that this feeds into the other kinds of parity. So first, we might imagine that money users will demand conversion of bank money into uh, central bank digital currencies. So in that case, we will have a bank run. So there's a pressure on exchange rate parity. And the question becomes how far can and will commercial banks as well as central banks, how far will they go in order to defend this exchange rate parity? Secondly, uh, there's also the, the, the element of uh, settlement parity. So probably money users will uh, use bank money to pay taxes and settle their debts. Uh, so that will create some sort of pressure on settlement parity. So the question becomes, how long will creditors keep accepting bank money in payment of debts? And also, how long will the treasury keep accepting bank money in payment of taxes? So these are, as, as Joseph also uh, um, uh, pointed out, these are also political questions in terms of legal tender laws and taxations. And basically the mechanisms I'm describing here are the mechanisms of Cresham's law, which says that bad money drives out good money. So also the possible uh, responses from the state, if it wanted to sustain this system, is either to make good money worse, which means that central banks will lower the interest rates on central bank digital currency to, uh, to, to uh, compensate for this lower risk, or on the other hand, uh, what could happen was that uh, someone would make bad money better, so commercial bank could increase their deposit rates to compensate for this difference. Anyway, to, to conclude this section, um, a digital cash scenario entails at least two open questions. First, um, how do markets perceive and price this risk differential between the two kinds of money? And secondly, how far can and how far should the state go in, in defending this uh, parity? Okay, now let me turn to the Folgild scenario. And I will uh, be honest here, I'll come out of the closet as also a monetary reformist. So I'm very much in favor of the Folgild uh, solution for uh, the same reasons that we've heard the former two speakers uh, mention. I believe that this system will be a much more simple, a much more robust, and also much more sustainable system in the long run. And this becomes clear if we look at it from the perspective of uh, parity. So what happens is essentially that what happens when we implement, if we, if we implement the full uh, Folgeld uh, solution, it actually means that central banks, they let go of the responsibility for exchange rate parity. So now there's no more deposit insurance, there's no more bailouts, and as we've uh, just heard uh, Mr. Ordonez say, I think we could also start deregulating uh, the banks uh, because now they are no longer, uh, we don't no, no longer have to take responsibility for, for the price of their money, so to speak. And also, and this is also what uh, Josef was talking about, uh, the treasury can also start accepting central bank digital currencies in payment of taxes. And even, and this is something that's uh, also interesting. It's a little bit of a side issue, but I think we should take all the benefits that we can. I think also there's the potential for integrating the payment system and the tax system. Uh, and this would uh, allow us maybe to reform our tax system, I mean, impose smarter taxes and also uh, avoid some of the fraud that we're uh, seeing at the moment. Uh, and what all of this amounts to is that now we have a situation where the parity between central bank digital currency and bank money is more of an open question. It will be determined in the market. And bank, banks may have an interest. Banks may 
do stuff to sort of retain this parity. Um, they could they could s support it by offering co convertibility, and they can also uh, do it by saying, well, if you want to pay your debts to us, we will still accept uh, bank money. But ultimately, it will be up to the market to, des to decide if bank money is still money on par with uh, central bank uh, digital currency. And more importantly, the state and the rest of the economy don't have to worry so much about whether this parity breaks down or not. And what we get is we get a much clearer separation between the public domain and responsibility and the private domain and responsibility. Uh, we could talk about this is very much in line with what Mr. Ordoners also said. We should think of this as a privatization of the banking system, a privatization of the banking system. And also on the other side, what we also get here is we get central banks who have much more leeway to just answer to the democratic society. Uh, so they don't have, they, they can be, they don't have to sort of be um, servants to the financial sector, but they can be service to the public and the general uh, economy. So now I've stated my position on the full guilt uh, solution, and I'd like to uh, try and translate that back to our analogy, and I think you can probably uh, already now figure out that if I were to advise, if Jens was my friend and I knew what uh, I've just said, I would say to him, you've tried now for 10 years to make this marriage work, you put in all your efforts, it hasn't worked, now it's time to try something new, and then I would probably say to him, well, you can go all the way and just divorce her immediately. But I, could all, I would also say, okay, yeah, give it a try. Um, go out with her, have an affair. And then just like with the parity, which sort of feeds from one circle to the next, I think that I would be confident that the same would happen with his uh, marriage, that eventually it would uh, lead to a divorce. Um, I would like to, now that I've had the... Uh, a pleasure of listening to uh, the other speakers and, and, and also Michael's. Um, I I'd like to add uh, uh, two comments here. Um, so you said something about how the banks may even, in some ways, benefit from a um, from a reform. And if, if we were to translate that into this uh, allegory, we, we might assume that even Tiffany would be happier in the long run with a with a divorce. Um, then I would also say I. I think, so uh, Michael has, and together with Claire Noon, have uh, proposed this sort of other uh, solution for uh, implementing central bank digital currency and have it circulating at parity with uh, bank money. And I think, I think it's a very ingenious solution, and I think if we must have both, I think it's certainly, uh, his principles are cer certainly worthwhile. I'm not convinced that they are so robust and that they're sustainable in the long run. I'm just going to throw this out here. I, I haven't thought. It. I think, in terms of the allegory, what you're proposing is an open relationship with perpetual couples counseling. We maybe think about whether that fits. Um, okay, so I will end here. Uh, I started with Plato, uh, and I'd like to end with the uh, Kierkegaard, and I'll leave it up to you to make sense of it in terms of our money problem. I think maybe this is a comment uh, to you, uh, Carl. You are the one who are, have to make the actual decision of whether to go along with this or not. So, uh, yeah, see, th this probably says something about the type of decision that, uh, that you're supposed to make. So Kierkegaard says this, marry and you will regret it. Don't marry, you will also regret it. Marry or don't marry, you will regret it either way. This gentleman is the essence of all philosophy. Thank you. <laughs> I think, Björk, you should, uh, or, or the one could tell another story. Um, Jens shouldn't have married um, <laughs> Tiffany at all, uh, because she is a bad, she's uh, very seducive, mm -hmm. so she has, um, and she's attracted, uh, attractive, but she's a bad woman. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> and therefore, he should um, divorce, um, at the end, mm -hmm. and but the role of the theory is to, uh, the role of the mainstream theory is to tell uh, Jens that the marriage to Tiffany is a wonderful thing. Yes, and uh, I think we have to change this narrative mm -hmm. um, and to 
uh, to recognize or to um, to understand that this marriage is n could could uh, never work and will never work. Mm -hmm. I think I think we could even I, I I very much agree with that point. I think I think the narrative that the mainstream or the mainstream theory says is to say to Jens, oh, men are useless, you're so bad, you're not, you can't do anything, you can't do on your own, you'll, you're not a good uh, man, so if you marry her, you won't get another one, and you can't... Uh, and I think we should step back from that and say, yes, we can. And I think there's been a tendency for mainstream economy to sort of put the state down in a way. That's also one of the critiques we often hear when we, we propose this monetary reform. One of them you get is, oh, how can the central bank know how much money is needed in the economy as if they're completely uh, useless and have no uh, reason? Uh, so yeah, I very much uh, agree, agree with that. Yeah, so uh, I was, uh, and this is kind of a question to all of the, the speakers of this session, uh, what if the three of them are in the same boat and uh, Birgit, was it, the wife's, ah, <laughs> the wife is still around. <laughs> so I'm, uh, I don't know if the, it, it's obvious the an analogy here, but I'm yeah. thinking uh, what I've been wondering uh, while hearing you, if we still have a banking sector, private, it won't disappear. If it's I, yeah. The too big to fail problem will still be there. So, yeah. yeah. So I, let me answer first in the concept of the allegory, and then in the second one. In the concept of the allegory, I think m maybe they have children together, so she will still be. There. They have, still have to collaborate on the children, right? So they have to make that work. That would be in the in the in the uh, yellow circle, right? There's still an actually life to be lived there and, and they have to work that out. Uh, okay, so how does this work? I think, I think we still need banks. Certainly, we, of course we need banks. However, we don't need them to create money, but we need their help in order to move money around. And that's what banks used to be good at. At the moment, I don't think they're so good at it because they're so preoccupied by creating money. But I do think this kind of goes uh, to, to also what Michael said, that in some ways, I think some of the banks would be better off in a way uh, because they would be forced to do what banks were sort of originally intended to do. And also what, what the econ economics textbooks tell us that they do, namely take deposits, evaluate possible borrowers, and then lend out to uh, productive uh, activities. And I think if we divorce this, the, the, the money creation and, and, and um, credit allocation, I think we could see banks um, doing much better. And, and another thing also, which also is something that uh, uh, Mr. Orden has touched upon, I think we, we would see a much better and much more healthy competition in the financial sector, which would allow us to harness some of the innovations that are right now happening in the fintech space. What's happening in the fintech space is you have a lot of, not necessarily young people, but a lot of young people coming up with a lot of inventions. However, what they all hope for is to develop an idea and develop a small company and then ultimately be bought up by a large bank because the way that the competition works now, it's, you, you, they can't sort of um, compete in the long run with the banks. And I think if we, if, we, if we did this, you would have much better competition. So we would see uh, a lot of uh, financial fintech innovation in, in a good way is my uh, positive vision. Uh, <clears throat> uh, two weeks ago I met a professor from Chile, an economics professor, and he told me that uh, in Chile, uh, um, when, you buy, when you buy things, and when you, when you pay by credit card or bank transfer, mm -hmm. you fetch the normal price. But when you try to pay in cash, yeah. you, you are fetched an extra price. Yeah. Isn't that counterintuitive yeah. re regarding your uh, reflections on the parity and that possibly in a new Gresham situation, the bank money might be mm -hmm. in, in the yeah. so-called bad position? Well, I think, I think this is, it is true that in this case, parity is also broken, but it's the other way around, right? So it's the state money, the central bank money. I think a way to account for that 
has to do with utility. So the utility of cash is lower than the utility of electronic money. That's also what we see in, in, uh, in Sweden. So in some places you can't even pay with cash because it's the utility of the electronic money. So it's another, but what happens now is that you introduce a new form of money with the same utility. And I think, I agree with you, it's not, I mean, it's not like then we implement this and then the next day we have a bank run. I don't think it necessarily is gonna play out that way. However, I do think that over time or at some point, markets are going to catch on to this. They're gonna start thinking, Oh, wait a minute, here's there's two kinds of money. Hmm, and what's, what's actually the difference? And th then people start thinking, and then ultimately they think, okay, this, if the bank goes down, this disappears, and this one does, and then they start pricing that in. Uh, but I, I agree with you that it's, we can't predict how long that's going to take. I don't want to be the one upsetting the, the timetable here. Uh, so thank you very much. Yeah, yeah thank you.